Good morning, Cloud Native community, and welcome back to the Second City. We're here at KubeCon, Cloud Native Con, CNCF's largest North American event. My name is Savannah Peterson, joined with my co-host, John Furrier. Good morning, John. Good Are you morning. as excited as I am today? Yes, it's a great day, great content, great energy, show floors buzzing, got great guests, got experts coming on, AI conversations in full swing, and this is going to be a great one. Speaking of, it sounds like you're teeing up our next segment. Please welcome our fabulous guests. We've got Chuck and Chris with us today from Red Hat. Thank you both for being here. AI, Kubernetes, definitely the buzz of the show. Chuck, I'm going to turn it to you just to open us up a little yeah. bit. Why is Kubernetes the chosen platform for the AI development that's going on right now? Well, you know, I think that you know, AI is a unique and new workload that has a lot of requirements that Kubernetes fits really well. Um, we found that, you know, for example, uh, there's not going to be a lot of folks who are actually building these models, but for those that are, like IBM with Watson X AI, they needed a solution that can scale to build and train the, their, their foundational models. They're using OpenShift in order to do that, and Kubernetes is at the heart of, of OpenShift. So, um, I think that Kubernetes over the last 10 years has evolved so that it works in the data center, it works on virtualization, it works in multiple clouds, it's extending to the edge. Um, and all of these footprints are where AI comes together with developers, it comes together with the applications, with where the data sources are. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, it's, it's a sort of a, a marriage made in heaven and also a little bit of a, of a nice coincidence that these two waves have sort of come together. You know, in May we had a great chat with Ashish Badani, who's the Chief Product Officer of Red Hat. He said, OpenShift is the generative AI for hybrid cloud. Uh, and it was kind of a um, grandiose statement, but in the sense of he's pointing to where it's yeah. going. What does that mean? Because OpenShift is really well like positioned that. in yeah, hybrid that's... cloud. What is the generative aspect of AI? How does that feed into some of the customer problems you guys have? Because there's a lot of business value being unlocked right. with AI, and that's like the key enterprise value right now. I mean, the consumer side's great. We see it, generative AI gets answers to questions. But on the business side, unlocking the value on the business side's key, how does that hybrid equation accelerate? I mean, Red Hat wants you to be able to run your models on your hardware with your data, right? You, we don't want you to get stuck in somewhere where you can't, um, you get locked in. Yeah. So we're enabling AI on those hyperscalers and you can move between them, you can put it on-prem. So OpenShift being built on top of Kubernetes gives us that power anywhere in the hybrid cloud. So you're going to be able to run your AI everywhere. What would you say for customers that asked, um, how do I leverage my existing environment? Because it seems that customers that have done the work are positioned well for the, the tailwind of AI. How do you guys see your customers leveraging what they got and to add in, say, net new capabilities? Because that seems to be the equation. What's, what, what does it look like? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, again, for example, uh, once you buy or license or decide to use maybe one of the open source foundational models that are readily available now, um, you need to train that model, preferably on yeah. your data, and over the last you know, 10 or 15 years, your data is in lots of different places with lots of different infrastructure choices. Um, you know, it could be the, the public cloud is where you keep all of your customer engagement data, but your business value data is locked behind your, your firewall and your data center. You need an AI platform that can run in those environments. And then you need to be able to take that train model to your development teams so they can build it into their applications. And again, that may be a different cluster in a different location with different team members. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that we talk about with OpenShift is the consistency of the environment from uh, the rel underneath the covers as the operating system to the libraries to yeah. the developer tooling um, so that developers feel free to move as fast as they can knowing that yeah. everything's consistent and things that worked in dev are going to work in prod, um, but also so that the platform engineering teams can really you know, set up these, uh, their policies and their uh, 
standards at a corporate level across wherever their teams are running. And I got to say, a lot of these people who've been doing it a while, they built their own platform, yeah. which I got to say is kind of like the hardware, right? Yeah. You know, things have moved so fast in the past five years where people were building these custom yeah. apps. Now we've got just a ton of great open source projects to lean on, new models that are so much better than they were years ago, new toolings to manage your development pipeline, your build pipeline, distributed training jobs across thousands of GPUs without any additional work. So the new stuff is so good, I feel like we're going to add a lot of value by just managing that for you, or just at least giving you yeah, the yeah. tooling yeah. so that you aren't trying to manage your own stack. That's a great point. Um, uh, if I may, Savannah, yeah. real quick. Because the open source community is buzzing. The, oh, yeah. the organic innovation yeah. is coming out of the open source. Everyone kind of knows that. But the big guys, the it's interesting, they call them proprietary models. I mean, the word proprietary, first of all, is weird, right? Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I guess open AI is proprietary, but they, they call themselves the open AI. So, so but the, the, the value are on more of the smaller pockets. And some are even saying on theCUBE, when we talk to the either in, uh, entrepreneurs and customers, I have small models that are my IP. Mm -hmm. my crown jewels, and I want to use that, but I don't want to have leakage. Exactly. Right. Okay, or I see an innovative open source project that's got some traction, momentum. Security there is I want to important. integrate that in. How do I incorporate that in? Because what's, what's great about open source? Yeah. Leveraging code from other people. Yeah, you shouldn't be yeah. the victim of data gravity. You should be able to run your AI where that data is, if you're modeled with no one else seeing it, not having to trust the SaaS with that kind of workload. So that's, that's one benefit for sure. So take us through what Red Hat's doing, because I think this is a customer challenge I think you guys solve. Yeah. I want to take advantage of the open source innovation. At the same time, I want to, I won't say risk management. I, want, I don't want any kind of weird stuff happening in my infrastructure. So I want, to, right. I want a controlled environment, but I want to let it run a little bit. How do I manage those guardrails? Yeah. How do I set it up so I'm, it's going to be working for me? Yeah, I was hoping I mean, shift do a that. Lo a lot of the, the work that we've done in the platform is, is made choices for our customers in terms of uh, things like assuming that you want dev to quickly go into production, and so having, you know, we make choices like you can't run as root in, in your development environment. It's, it's sometimes a quick and speedy way of getting things done, but it leads to problems when you run into production. So uh, the, the default security stance is, is designed you know, very much to the shift yeah. left uh, movement of DevSecOps so that developers are building on a secure platform at the same time, we want to make sure that developers don't feel hindered by that. Like mm -hmm. they know they have the safety belts and the airbags and the ABS brakes, but we're not making them have to necessarily deal with all of that stuff before they can start the key to the engine and really start moving. Um, the, the platform itself, in terms of being built on Red Hat Enterprise Linux, we we're, Red Hat's all about life cycling and making enterprise ready the innovation from open source. And so sometimes that means that you know, a new feature becomes available, but there's a day zero. So who's making sure that that, that testing and validation has happened before it touches yeah. your dev or prod environments? And then later when you're running in production, uh, a new uh, CVE becomes available. Um, it's fixed in open source, but it's fixed in the latest version. What if I'm running a recent but older version what, do I have to rewrite my whole application? Do I have to break things in yeah, order yeah. to fix things? Um, and a lot of times what value of Red Hat provides is that we're bringing back that innovation. We're also bringing back hardware enablement for things like GPUs and TPUs. We're bringing back security without having to necessarily yeah. rewrite, reinstantiate, touch your applications, just do a quick refresh of the library and, and move forward. What I'm hearing from you is a really great emphasis on user experience. Yeah. And I think that's one of the benefits of working with you guys on OpenShift is you've thought about this at scale with a lot of different things so you can decrease the cognitive load for the developer on their journey or for these teams as they're yeah. adopting. Yeah, generally, yeah. Red Hat definitely wants to make this the Kubernetes the platform for AI yeah. and enabling all those workloads with the least amount of work. And we want you to be able to operationalize Small AI. Small task. <laughs> <laughs> we can't accord, as they would say here in the Midwest. Yeah. It's can't right. Well, it is a big task, actually. Yeah. And you know, a lot of data science projects die in the experimental phase. You end up with a notebook that nobody else can read and the model's sitting there doing no one any good. So yeah. we want to be the platform that allows you to operationalize that and make sure it gets into your applications and is useful all the way through that development yeah. life cycle. 
I think, yeah, I, I, I love, you, we've talked a lot about how companies are leveraging this, but we're here celebrating the open source community. Right, I know that that is extremely important to y'all. This is actually, you're losing your KubeCon virginity together here, your first <laughs> time getting to meet the whole community, which is very exciting. We're excited to, to be part of that experience for you, just to get the guests on their toes. But I'm, I'm curious, and I know that we all, this is something we very much agree on, why is the open source community so important to AI and the hype and everything that we're seeing happen right now? Chuck, I'm going to start with you. Well, I, you know, for for AI and just in general, I think it's the engine for for all of the innovation that we're that we're doing. I think one company and one company's vision is a is a voice, and open source is the symphony that's really you know with the narrative and it's moving us forward. Um, Love the analogy. Are you a singer? No. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to hear that. I was going to say you could give us a taste right now. Uh, but, so. but at the same time, you know, there's, you know, there are a lot of different choices that are out there. Red Hat tries to catch waves when we can, um, but we also listen to our customers and listen to their needs. So we have a, a strong history of, you know, we we caught the Kubernetes wave pretty early in the uh, container uh, orchestration wars, if you remember that. Oh yeah. Um, you know, that was a bet and. It was a successful bet. Uh, if it hadn't been successful, we have would have had a bunch of enterprise customers that we needed to continue to lifecycle, support, manage to whatever the thing that would have won in that parallel universe. Um, and that's kind of the the secret sauce of, of where, where Red Hat fits in. It's like we're not always going to get it right, um, but we want to make sure that we're open to you either pulling in. A, a purely open source project or something that's been productized by one of the partners who are out on the show floor um, that are part of our ecosystem. You can plug in their service mesh if it has capabilities that are not available to, to us and ours, or you can add on things that are bleeding edge and you know, there are things yeah. that we're, you know, we're always participating in stuff that we're not necessarily productizing yet. So we're trying to catch those waves, we're trying to be involved in those. Backstage was a great example mm -hmm. of yeah. you know, a, a very fast community that all of a sudden had everybody's yeah. attention and we were already sort yeah. of in there in the, in the mix and we're working to productize yeah, that and, for our and customers. And props on that security angle on Backstage too, you guys put together yeah. pretty strong. Uh, Chris, you mentioned something earlier, I want to come back to if you don't mind. You mentioned you want to, have Kubernetes be the best place to run AI workloads. Okay, let's unpack that a little if you don't mind. What does that mean? Because you're seeing Kubernetes become boring, it's, that's a good thing. <laughs> it's like, it's working. It's like Linux, it's, it's working. Why is that successful? Why is Kubernetes best to run AI workloads? And the second part of that question is, as we start to see stuff move into production, mm -hmm. which is the key metric, what is actually going to be scaling into production? Because the models are great but you know, it's a system, right? So. But, <laughs> I think the scaling is going to be, well, one of the huge problems yeah. with AI in general is the cost and the compute, obviously, so and Kubernetes being as scalable and performant as it is, is just a huge benefit to that. If you're going to train your model across a thousand GPUs for 30 days, Kubernetes is going to let you do that, right? And you know, OpenShift AI helps you manage that, but yeah. it's Kubernetes underneath it, and plenty of companies are doing so. And also the inference, you need that kind of scalability to control that cost, right? If you've only got 10 users, you want to have two pods, or if you have 1,000 users, you need that to automatically scale up to 1,000 pods or whatever you need, and Kubernetes allows us to do that. It's interesting, Kubernetes is growing up so much to the dream state we, we, we imagined years ago. Of, it's going to orchestrate everything. Well, let's unpack that as open source models come in, more stuff's coming in, there's more moving parts in, in essentially a complex distributed computing system. And that's what's going on in these environments. We mentioned Backstage, we had other companies saying that solving the end-to-end -end, uh, work streams and workflows is a complex system. It's yeah. not like you throw something at it and it solves everything. It's got to be engineered or architected. That's the conversation here. Is Kubernetes ready for prime time in the sense of scaling that next level? How would you guys describe that to give someone who's enthusiastic about it the confidence that Kubernetes is, is totally moving yeah, in the right direction? I mean, I think that the one, one thing that Kubernetes and the community have done really well is keeping Kubernetes focused on a core set of capabilities and enabling an ecosystem of CNCF projects that build on top of that. So Kubernetes itself, like you said, has become sort of boring, stable, productive. Um, but a lot of its extendability is you know, part of the secret sauce. It's been yeah. built into, the, mm -hmm. into that core um, and allows us to do things that weren't even anticipated at the beginning of, of Kubernetes. You know, 
uh, Red Hat has been uh, uh, one of the, the bigger proponents of KubeVirt. So making a, a container orchestration engine run virtual machines was never envisioned by, by the Kubernetes community at the beginning, but because they left us with a orchestration engine that was extendable in a predictable way, we're able to extend it to all these new use cases. And you know, we're, we're seeing that one size does not yeah. fit all. Um, we see that certainly on the edge as well, where yeah. we've done a lot of work with OpenShift to get Kubernetes yeah. to smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, but we just recently announced a Red Hat Device Edge, which is a way of getting those workloads that you have designed in, in OpenShift and in Kubernetes down to, you know, sensors and endpoints and, yeah. and, yeah. and, and they'll be AI enabled, like which, yeah. mean, which brings the question of what's the blockers for getting AI workloads into production? Are the things that you guys seeing emerging, is it evolutionary, is it more of there are things in the way? What's, how would you answer that question? What well, the, I would say it's, it's kind of hard because there's a handoff there from yeah. the data scientist to the MO ops and ops personnel to finally getting consumed by um, your developers. And, a successful AI ML project doesn't stop at the development stage. It's got to get built repeatedly using maybe pipelines and distributed training. You got to put it on storage. Now you've got to wrap that in a service so that your developers can make use of it just like they would any other microservice in your organization. Um, so you know, we need to make sure that that workflow is optimized for AI and that people are able to make yeah. good use of their clusters that way. I think that's uh, yeah, I think that's an important. It's 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 always come down to ease of use, and we just want to make things faster and easier, and let more people have access to do that. Gentlemen, this is uh, such a fun chat to have. I'm curious, since we'll all be in Paris together, what do you hope you can say six months from now that we can't yet say? I'm gonna start with you, Chris. Oh my gosh, I am say I'm gonna say let's hope the tooling comes up to the promise of AI, and we all get to enjoy it yeah. for our betterment. Yeah. Um, I, I think that I would like to see the, the walls continuing to break between the traditional ops teams and the, and the dev teams as more companies take this journey. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think we're, we've gone out. from yeah. you know, developers having to do mother may I and put in tickets to get stuff done, and I'm really excited just about yeah. you know, now we can set up environments maybe based on backstage and others where there, there are policies in place, but the, the freedom is there to move yeah. within those policies and 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 provide developers just you know the ability to go, but know that they're protected, know that they're not going to have to rewrite stuff when they go into production. That momentum for platform engineering is yeah. awesome. I think that's going to be a big driver. Yeah, that's people see platform engineering as a as a DevOps joint shared mission. Yeah, I, I think you know. That, that becomes the, the new title that everybody wants to yeah. have in the office department <laughs> as, they, as they shed their VMware admin title. Yeah, we'll take that argument to Twitter. Everyone's going to be weighing in on that. I love that. Yeah. Um, we have an opinion on that. We love platform engineering. We're biased. We think it's, uh, we think it's, uh, we think platform engineering is the next modern IT. Yeah. I think we think that's going to mm -hmm. be, because SRE kind of grew up in that whole area of that DevOps movement, but now when you go mainstream, it's a, it's a completely re-architected, complex system. Absolutely. And the single pane of glass could be voice activated. Provision those clusters, you know? Yep. <laughs> load, <laughs> load open shift. So, you guys We're all looking forward to a bright future. Yeah, exactly. And I look forward to having yeah. conversations about yeah. breaking down walls and about tooling with you both in Paris. Thank you for being here with yeah. us on theCUBE. John, thank you always yeah. for being my co-host. And thank you for tuning in to the Paris of the Prairie here at KubeCon, CNCF, Cloud Native Con. My name's Savannah Peterson. You're watching theCUBE, the leading source for emerging tech news.